and I'm a senior lecturer in Italian studies at Australian National University. And I'm co-convening this conference with my colleague, Dr. Katrina Grant, who's a senior lecturer at the Center for Digital Humanities Research, also at Australian National University. So thank you everybody for coming and responding to our uh, call for papers that went out a few months ago on digital approaches to multilingual text analysis. Uh, we were just saying we were pleased to see such a wide variety of submissions and interest from people uh, really around the world when we sent out our call for papers. So we have presenters from the US, Australia, Korea, Germany, Spain, and China, who are all working on different issues dealing with multilingual text uh, analysis. The idea behind the conference was just kind of an observation of the growing number of projects happening in DH in languages other than English. And we just wanted to hear more about what people are doing, uh, how scholars are dealing with issues in their research in other languages, uh, problems that they might have encountered, how they resolve them, what kind of issues they're working on. And we just chose this lightning talk format uh, because we've seen it work before and it's a relatively easy informal way to um, have a conference with much interest. Uh, the title of the conference is Digital Approaches to Multilingual Text Analysis. So it's really just a kind of recognition that much of the disciplinary discourse in digital humanities, but not just digital humanities, also in many other disciplines, for those of us who work in um, universities that are based in English, uh, you know, speaking countries, um, much of that discourse still happens in English and on English language data. So it poses several problems for our field, but particularly for programs, um, for people in programs of languages and or linguistics that focus on um, places or peoples or cultures or objects uh, that aren't in English, not just in terms of broader questions about how our research is framed, but also in terms of the actual tools we use to carry out and do our research. Uh, there's many different projects, you know, that deal with the non-English speaking world. But today we really just wanted to focus on digital approaches to text analysis in languages other than English and to look at what new possibilities have emerged. Thinking about also Fioramonte's question, uh, whether a non-Anglo digital humanities is possible and what its characteristics might be. So the papers today represent a diverse range of projects and critiques of digital methods across um, many different languages. Uh, we've divided the, this conference into four sessions. So 10 minutes for talking, 10 minutes for questions. Um, some people might speak for a bit more and speak for a bit less. They might ask um, a few more questions or decide to answer a few less questions. So it's very informal. We're really just kind of having a discussion and talking about what everybody's doing. Um, please mute yourself unless you're presenting or asking a question and you can raise your hand for questions as well. Um, Katrina's done an extraordinary job, I think, of sorting out a, a program and a timetable that fits across three or four different continents. Uh, the program with the abstract is available through the Eventbrite link and it's I've just put it in the chat as well. We'll have scheduled breaks throughout the day just to have some break and some respite from Zoom. Um, so those breaks are after each session and to ensure a reasonable time for presenters to be awake in their respective countries as well. Um, we we're just saying we had many requests to record uh, this session. So we've decided to go ahead with that, mainly because of the problem with the time zones and of um, scheduling conflicts as well. But we've had uh, over 100 people register for the conference. And so obviously, um, people would like to listen to some sessions later on. Uh, obviously, it's with your permission as well. So if you prefer not to be recorded, then please just let us know and we can stop the recording for your session. Um, just let us know in the chat or via a DM or that that will be fine. Um, Katrina, is there anything else that we should cover at the start? No, I think that's everything. Okay. Yes. Any right. questions, just pop them in the chat. I'll, me and Josh will monitor the chat um, as we go. Great, thank you. 
All right. Well, without further ado, it's a great pleasure and an honor to introduce our keynote speaker for this conference, Quinn Dombrowski. Quinn is the Academic Technology Specialist in the Division of Literatures, Cultures and Languages, as well as in the library at Stanford University, and has really been a pioneer uh, in research on multilingual DH. I can see her wincing as I'm saying these words, but I think it's true, actually. Um, Quinn has been and uh, has been and is heavily involved in various aspects of DH research and teaching uh, in multilingualism. And I love how on her website, uh, it says that they've been on many DH adventures including support at the High Performance Computing Cluster at UC Berkeley, running the DIRT tool directory with support from the Mellon Foundation and many other initiatives. Quinn teaches courses on non-English DH at Stanford, uh, started a textile makerspace. They started the Data Sitters Club and Quinn is currently the co-vice president of the Association for Computers and the Humanities. Quinn has a forthcoming chapter on multilingual digital humanities in the Bloomsbury Handbook for DH. Uh, her other publications are equally wide ranging and impressive and boast such titles as bringing languages into the DH classroom and preparing non-English texts for computational analysis. As keynote for our conference, uh, Quinn has agreed very kindly, I have to say, to give a slightly longer talk of around 20 minutes or so and maybe five or 10 minutes at the end as well for questions, um, if that's okay. Uh, the talk today is entitled Non-English DH is Not a Thing. So it's a very appetizing title. So Quinn, thank you so much and over to you. Thank you for the, the kind introduction. Uh, so let me share the screen here. There we go. All right, let's go into presenter mode. All right, is that coming through okay for everyone? All right, multilingual DH is not a thing. Um, I'll, I'll admit when I, I saw the call for papers for this event, um, I, I, I saw it in something of a cranky mood. Um, and uh, on, on one hand, it, it's wonderful to see the ways in which uh, you know people are um, thinking about language in ways that they perhaps hadn't been before. And there's there's greater interest in um, you know, work on and about multilingual DH and its its many facets, um, but you know, actually trying to make some of these things happen in practice um, in the classroom, in the classrooms of people, particularly um, who aren't coming from modern languages departments, um, has has led me to appreciate the ways in which um, it's it's a lot more complex than um, you know than perhaps we we sell it to other people and 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 even realize ourselves. Um, so I'll, I'll be I'll be musing on that topic today. To to what extent is multilingual DH actually a thing in and of itself? Um, a bit more about whoops, about me and and how I ended up uh, getting here. Um, so the the picture on the left is uh, you know an, an American high school tradition. Sort of on your graduating year of high school, um, you take these like very sincere pictures. Um, you know in these like fancy photo studios that like you cringe about later in life. Um, you know, sometimes posed with like objects that were like meaningful for you at the time. Um, and so for, for me, that was languages. And, and these were the things that represented the languages that, that I had, had seriously studied at that point. Um, you know, Russian, Japanese, and, and Spanish. And I had traveled to Argentina for a summer um, as, as part of that process. Um, you know, as, as a small child, I was sent to German school on Saturdays. Um, and, and, and this, this was really, um, you know, adaptive, I discovered. Um, because, you know, in, in kind of early elementary grades, it gave me a way to um, insult the bullies without getting in trouble. Um, because if no one understands what you're saying, then they can't possibly get you in trouble, can they? Um, but it's still very satisfying and, and cathartic. Um, and I mean, this, this was generally something that, that continued kind of over the course of, of my childhood, um, living with a wicked stepmother in, in high school, uh, you know, I would wake up extra, extra early, you know, at like 4.30 or, or 5 a.m. to get an extra hour or two of studying Russian and um, realizing that, you know, knowing things and knowing languages was something that she couldn't take away from me. Um, so I went to university at the University of Chicago, um, you know, got the first BA, MA in Slavic linguistics there. Um, and, you know, started a PhD 
quit a month later, uh, mm -hmm. realizing that I was more interested in, in how people do research and helping people do research better than, um, you know, finding some deep dive topic in Slavic linguistics to spend the next five plus years of my life on myself. Yeah, I've picked up a you know degree in library and information science along the way, ended up working in central IT for 10 years, including on the uh, infamous Project Bamboo, a uh, melon funded cyber infrastructure uh, disaster. And, um, you know, eventually, you know, my funding got cut and I ended up in high performance computing for a year uh, before this job opened at Stanford that basically brought together everything that I had ever loved in my life. Um, you know, languages, the digital humanities, uh, the community building. And, and that is how I found myself working in the Division of Literatures, Cultures and Languages at Stanford. Um, this dress I'm, I'm wearing here on the right is um, all of the language <laughs> advertising posters for all of our departments that year that I turned into fabric and sewed into a dress. Um, so, I mean, it's a position with a lot of flexibility working across a lot of different languages. Um, unfortunately, the East Asian department split off um, some years in the past. Um, and so they're no longer in, in my department's purview. Um, but, you know, Spanish, um, Catalan, Italian, French, uh, German, uh, you know, and Complet, which is the home for all the and other languages, um, mm -hmm. you know, anyone working in those fields, I, I have the opportunity to support in their projects. Um, but it also leaves a fair amount of, of room for kind of advocacy and, you know, trying to, to build community and, and create spaces, um, you know, in, with an eye towards there being a, a future for the, my students and my colleagues. Um, within DH, despite the fact that none of them work on English primarily or at all. Um, but this is not to to overlook a lot of the work that happened beforehand. And and you know, I've I've realized that the years in which I was very heavily heavily involved in the infrastructure side of things, and the technology side of things, coincided with um, a number of of very important events um, that sort of lead up to the the moment that you know where I find myself at at Stanford starting to to make noise. Um, you know, about multilingual DH in a slightly different sense than it had been used before. Um, you know, roughly, you know, 2012 to 2014, um, you know, the, a lot of the framing of multilingual DH had to do, broadly speaking, with scholarly communication. Um, you know, Eliko Ortega's, um, you know, I Whisper campaign that, that she helped lead and, and wrote up as part of Global Outlook DH, um, you know, with the idea that, like, at the conference, people could sort of, you know, whisper, you know, synchronous translations um, of talks for people. Um, they, they realized logistically that ended up being challenging. And so they ended up, you know, live tweeting, for instance, um, across different languages as a way to, to bridge the communication gap. Um, and, and this is something that um, hasn't, really, hasn't really changed uh, since then. Um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of interest, um, you know, particularly for people um, you know, who work not only on languages, but in different languages, um, to have those languages represented, um, you know, through conferences, through publications, ensure that those publications get cited um, in, in different ways. Um, and, and I mean, these, these continue to be very much like living issues, um, not only, you know, with sort of English versus like all the other languages, um, but also thinking of some of the smaller languages versus the other um, imperial languages. So, um, you know, the, the idea of a, a DH journal in Spanish, um, you know, is, is easier to conceive of than a, a DH journal in Catalan. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the question of who has rights to publish in what languages and to try to make that work available and understood to people without relying on another language as an intermediary, um, I mean, it's a, it can be a recursive problem uh, kind of all the way, all the way down the, the power spectrum. Um, I, I think probably one, one more thing to mention before moving on to the next point. Um, yeah, I mean, re relates to these issues of, of you know, who holds the, the keys to, to power, who runs listservs, what languages are the, the call for proposals in. Um, and and then none, of these, none of these issues have gone away or been resolved in, in any real meaningful sense, um, you know, other than perhaps the proliferation of some of these venues. Um, the fact that now there are journals um, in, in, you know, French and in Spanish. Um, I believe perhaps Portuguese as well, um, you know, and there are resources that span those languages, but, you know, kind of the, the issues of, of who holds the power and who holds um, kind of the keys to communication um, are still very much alive. Then there's this, this sort of bridging period um, from 2014 to around 2018, um, where there is a lot of interest and energy and, and publication around um, multilingual DH and local praxis. 
Um, you know, what does DH look like in different places um, where, where language is a component of that, but not necessarily all of it. Um, and the, the groundbreaking project here, um, you know, is, is Alex Gill's around DH in 80 days, um, where he and a team, you know, sort of did project write-ups about projects that, that took place, um, you know, kind of across the world over the course of, of 80 days, one project per day. Um, and, and as you can see, I mean, it, it didn't cover everywhere in the globe, but it, it covered a lot more than kind of where you usually hear of a lot of the energy um, in the room being taken up by, you know, the US and Western Europe and um, sort of expanded the view of, of what people were, were doing. Um, I mean, relevant for, for this conference perhaps is the fact that a lot of these projects um, kind of were digital archive, digital collection kinds of projects. Um, you know, people digitizing things and putting them online, perhaps transcribing them, um, kind of that, that vein of DH, um, which is in, in a certain sense has a lower technical barrier and, and less entanglement with language as such mm -hmm. than, um, you know, text analysis where we start getting into higher yeah. demands, both for the technology to implement it, um, but also for the language models and, and kind of other, uh, you know, text pre-processing tools that you'd need to be able to, to do some of this work across languages. Um, which, which brings me to 2019 and now and, and beyond. Um, you know, again, in, in the context of these two kind of previous waves of, of things called multilingual DH, um, you know, which are still with us, um, you know, this has been a time, uh, you know, following on a uh, pre-conference workshop at DH 2019 organized um, by Cosima Wagner and others um, on uh, non-Latin DH, so DH done with non-Latin scripts, um, you know, we, we got to talking after the pre-commons workshop and that night I had jet lag as, as one does going to, to Europe from the West Coast of the US. And we, we bought a domain name and made a simple website and that's how multilingualdh.org started, um, you know, in, a, in an Airbnb in, um, in Utrecht. And, uh, you know, this built upon a, a list of um, resources for doing natural language processing in a bunch of languages that I, I had put together, um, which followed on from the class that I taught, um, which was a bring your own language DH class where everyone came with their own language and we figured out how to do things, um, you know, to the extent possible with those languages. Um, and and we've, we've sort of been working on this a bit ever since, um, kind of with all the caveats of, of pandemic with it. Um, including a bibliography of, of recent and less recent work on things, um, you know, called multilingual DH that, that span across these kind of three framings of the problem. Um, but of course, I mean, these, these three kind of lenses are, are, are not everything. And there, there are more issues at play, um, you know, than, than just language in each of them. Um, you know, when you look at local DH praxis, um, for instance, there is a, a great article um, in the uh, Digital Studies um, Canadian uh, DH Journal um, about DH praxis in Ireland uh, by James O'Donnell, which is a, I, I found to be a fascinating look at the ways that um, local DH praxis um, can vary so significantly, um, even if you remove the variable of, of language, that um, the way that Irish DH um, sort of happened to develop was, was so dependent as, as many of these are, um, on kind of who the founding figures were and what their interests were and what their relationships were with kind of the larger powers um, in the world, you know, be it kind of the tendencies in European DH or, um, you know, a US based DH. And power and, and scholarly communications are, are also much more complicated landscapes. Um, certainly language is a factor um, in what gets cited um, and what people read and, you know, languages of, of kind of international uh, list hosts and, and things like that. Um, but as I'm, I'm sure um, many folks on this call uh, appreciate all too acutely, time zone, uh, as we've come to realize, um, is, is also a major axis of power. Who's, whose time zone gets considered when you're creating um, Zoom events? And, and you know, hats off to uh, Katrina, particularly uh, for, for this conference, um, for picking um, really a, a remarkably good time zone for a lot of people across the, the globe, um, but particularly in a way that, that decenters, um, you know, folks that usually get first billing for, for time zone consideration. Um, living on the, the West Coast, this means I, I have a ridiculous number of 6 a.m. meetings across the pandemic, um, because that's 9 a.m. for folks on the East Coast, and um, there's just more of them. 
Um, <clears throat> and so they they sort of we we schedule based on them and trying to accommodate folks in in Europe um, in a way that yeah leads leads me to be up at six a.m. far more often than I'd like. Um, so there's there's time zone, you know, there's like institutional position, um, you know, looking at the power of, of faculty versus staff. And I mean, in, in my own sort of career trajectory, um, I've come to appreciate acutely, um, you know, issues of, of, you know, sort of autonomy and being able to, you know, drive one's own agenda and make one's own choices and priorities. Um, if I were tenured faculty, I, I would have had a lot more of that across much more of my career um, versus my own staff position where my responsibilities can basically be changed out from under me. Um, and, and, you know, there's not a whole lot I can do about it. It's just, congratulations, this is what you're doing now. Um, so there's, there's more factors at, at play here, here too. Um, and research and pedagogy also are, are far from monolithic. Um, you know, the, the things that, that people want to do um, with Latin and Greek, you know, sort of we, we, we see a different cluster of, of tools and resources and activities, um, you know, kind of for the classics languages um, you know, than we do for Chinese, than we do for Russian or Spanish, um, you know, let alone smaller languages like, like Catalan or, or Burmese. Um, it's, it's, there, there's no one answer that will cover all of these things. Um, and so when, when talking to people um, who come at this with a great deal of, of goodwill and interest and wanting to make their course materials support multilingual DH, um, all, all the best intentions in the world, um, but the, the, the fact is that multilingual DH is not a thing, um, not like that anyways. Um, it's, it's not like the sort of thing where you could, you know, you know decolonize your syllabus by, by adding, um, you know, more authors, um, you know, from, uh, you know, colonized countries. It's not like you can like, add more female authors to your syllabus and call it a day. If you're teaching text analysis in particular um, and you're teaching it based on English, um, there's, there's no like one trick you can do that will support all the languages your students might want to work with, um, unless they all happen to want to work with the same language, which basically never happens. Um, there, there are certainly some languages that people in different contexts are more likely to want to work with than others. Um, but, you know, at least the major um, languages, I mean, you're, you're likely to encounter at least two that will need different kinds of things to be able to, to follow along with the lessons in a way similar to English. Um, so in, in the last year or so, I've worked with Melanie Walsh, who put together this fabulous introduction to cultural analytics in Python, um, and Python and had this section on text analysis. And it, it was, you know, as per usual, text analysis in English. And I offered to, um, you know, take a handful of languages. Again, we, we didn't know in advance what languages her students wanted to work with um, and basically duplicate those lessons with the necessary pre-processing for, you know, this, this handful of languages um, for them to be able to, at the end of this course, walk away with the same confidence and capabilities of, of doing things as the students who wanted to work on English. Um, this, is, this is always the gap where, you know, if you want to work on Spanish, but you um, are taught about how to use English, um, you walk away without sort of the practical ability to do so that your you know, peers working in English do. Um, so this, this is what we, we came up with, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it on one level. Um, but on, on the other hand, I, I also recognize what was left out. Um, which was, there was another student in her class who wanted to work on Burmese. And um, all of these languages here are supported by um, a, a framework called Spacey. Um, Burmese absolutely was not. And it turns out there's even multiple encoding systems and you can't even count on Unicode. So in, in the end, just due to practical reasons, we, we ended up um, writing that off. But I, I wish we could have done more on that front. So as I was saying, um, you know, frameworks um, and, and models where you can sub in models for different languages really do lower barriers for being able to support more than one language. Um, of course, I mean, at least if taught in the US, the, the language by default is going to be English. Um, but you know, if, if you have someone with a basic linguistic knowledge of these other languages and, and what they need to, you know, how you need to modify them for them to end up uh, you know, looking roughly like English in terms of the amount of, of morphological variation present in words, you can use something like Spacey where you don't have to change all the code in your, uh, in your textbook. Um, but you can change little bits that sort of process the text in different ways and, and can allow students to more or less continue with the lesson in the same way that their peers are. Um, and there, there are projects like New Languages for NLP um, out of Princeton uh, led by Andrew Janko and um, Tasha Emerlayev and um, 
and others uh, that are, are trying to um, kind of train humanists in developing models for spacey um, so that more languages could have this option to sort of like be subbed in for kind of within a common framework for, for, doing, for doing NLP. Um, but then of course, there's the question of, of which languages get models. And, and you know, while we tried to get um, a broad you know, range of languages that were underrepresented with NLP um, for this, I mean, what we ended up with is, is more historical languages that, that might be great if we want to teach uh, you know, DH text analysis with a time machine, um, you know, or for, for specialists in those historical languages and areas. Um, then we were able to, for people um, kind of with living languages um, that are underrepresented in, in other ways. Um, there are other resources out there. Um, Universal Dependencies has um, you know, really a fantastic number of, of tree banks um, for a wide range of languages, including you know, minority languages, um, you know, languages with smaller numbers of speakers. Um, and, and all of this is a start. And this, these, are, these are kind of necessary prerequisites um, you know, in many cases for being able to train new models to be able to um, you know, sub in other languages in, in this context. Um, but lots of data, it turns out, doesn't actually mean good performance in practice, um, as, as we've discovered. This is a, a project that I, I work on, the, the Data Sitters Club, um, where uh, we, we take um, this classic 80s and 90s girls series, The Babysitters Club, and look at it in translation and apply various text analysis things. Um, and just even in terms of the numbers of times that the English spacey model correctly identified a character as the subject of a verb, um, the, the English model was vastly better at identifying that like something was a subject of a verb than, than the French model. Um, as you can see here with the sort of an English example and a French example where it's, it's taking what should be a subject and a verb and thinks it's sort of a compound adjective. Um, and it, it doesn't always, the, the, we tried many different translations and um, none of them were great, even the modern French, which is the closest to um, kind of what the French spacey model was trained on. Um, so really what we need is a lot of focused language specific work, um, you know, within the communities of people who work on a particular language, um, you know, there's a lot of work for us to be done to, to make these things actually usable and, and good. And that really has to happen in the context of, of specialists within that language. Like there is no multilingual DH help group that can help with all of them at once. It's, it's language by language, it's slog by slog. Um, we can share pointers and tips, but at the end of the day, it's, 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 you know, we need to sort of break off into these small communities. And maybe in some sense that parallels DH more broadly. Um, you know, there are many sort of smaller communities within DH and, and here I gesture towards methodology more than discipline. Um, but it's, it's, it's not like, you know, the DH is, is, is sort of completely um, you know, fungible where you can sort of like swap in a digital history person for a digital literature person for a digital art person, your map person for your text encoding person for your, you know, NLP person, you know, there's, there's many different pockets of DH, um, but all of it we still call DH while, while recognizing the differences and recognizing the, the ways they can't really be substituted necessarily. Um, which takes me to one of my favorite quotes about DH from Scott Weingard. Um, that we all suck at most of DH, um, or for a bit of a broader context, um, you know, it's an imposter syndrome house of mirrors. You look around and see experts in GIS, TEI, data viz. It's hard to remember that people tend to be good at one of those things when the collective appears to be good at them all, which then makes me think perhaps we can use this framing to, to tie people back to language with help from, from Emily Bender, um, a linguist who's sort of advocated for what's become known as the Bender rule, which more or less works, comes down to name the language you're working on. Um, and, and just as you know, people tend to be good at one or two or a small handful of methodologies in DH, um, you know, maybe just getting people to, to recognize that you know, language is also something that we need to talk about. You know, I am a DH person who does GIS in English. Um, maybe that's something that we can add on. And, and once, we, once we make that language visible, um, and sort of recognize that different people have different linguistic expertise along with different methodological expertise. Um, you know, this, this might be a way to, to kind of surface more issues and, and help identify specialists. Um, multilingual DH doesn't exist as a thing, not a thing that you can make your class support, um, you know, with one easy trick, but, but maybe collectively, just as we all make DH happen through our individual bits of, of technical and disciplinary expertise, maybe multilingual DH thing can become a thing um, kind of through our collective expertise with language as well. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Quinn. This was so wonderful to have uh, your overview and your words to really begin the conference. And it's so great to have kind of your personal history about how you got into, now I'm scared of calling it multilingual DH. I think I'm expecting another reaction. Oh, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can call it that, just the, with caveats and asterisks and footnotes. But, yeah, maybe for the next you know few hours, then I'll direct them to your talk. and. But you know, to hear kind of the way that somebody gets into kind of this kind of this area, but also this panoramic view as well of different kinds of issues in the field of people working in digital humanities and languages other than English. Um, there's lots of meat in your talk, so there's lots of things to consider. Um, Katrina's just posted in the chat, so if people would like to post questions in the chat or otherwise raise their hand, um, I think. Quinn is happy to take a few minutes for questions if we have yeah. those as well. That would be really wonderful. Um, it sounds like it's it's just in constant development. There's so many new websites and new initiatives that are happening. Um, is the is I mean is it really a question? Do you think Quinn of making uh, like I mean you said make visible and kind of name particular languages or name things that we're working on is that uh, a way to do you think bridge kind of the different pockets of things that you are that people are doing i mean honestly i i think everyone probably who's most likely to be here already does that and does a great job with it i mean when, when was the last time you you went to a talk um you know about you know text analysis with no like caveats um, and we're like shocked to discover that it was in, you know, that it was about Chinese. Like no one does that. Like if it's, if it's about Chinese, you say it's about Chinese. If it's about Russian, you say it's about Russian. But the people who work only on English don't say it's about English. Um, and and you know, th this is this is constantly a challenge because you know, I I give these talks about things, um, and I'm always preaching to the choir because the <laughs> monolingual English people don't show up. Um, and and so. Um, you know, like, but, but I mean, when, like, what I've started doing is when I see it, I very gently call it out. I mean, the, the other day, you know, a, a colleague of mine was, you know, teaching, uh, you know, about text analysis. And I looked at his materials and I'm like, hey, it, it looks like what you're doing is only going to work for English. Is it okay? Let me, let me put in a pull request to say, you know, text analysis for English. And we put in a little friendly paragraph being like, if you want to work with someone, you know, on, on data and language, like, please let us know. We're happy to help. And lo and behold, the Portuguese project shows up um, who, you know, that wouldn't really be served by this workshop, um, at least not with a little bit more scaffolding and, and support. So, um, you know, not, not that the answer is to like name and shame our monolingual English colleagues, but I mean, I think we're getting to the point where like exerting at least a little bit of pressure to say like, you know, if it's, you know, English is a language too, and, and we need to name it as such, just like everyone else does. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think that's an unreasonable ask. Fantastic, thank you. Um, somebody's just posted that they didn't get the website of the Python text analysis oh, me, slide. So I just stick the slides in the, in the chat. Yeah, um, that's available. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I can't see any other hands up or um, to yeah, ask I a think question. Jane, Jane Simpson's just had a comment that you should, name the language you're working on and the language you're working in, which I think is relevant. And it was certainly relevant to me because I, yeah, I work on, on Italian, but in English, I write in English about another language. So yeah, that's a, but I thought, I mean, I had a quick question if there's no one else asking a question just about, um, uh, I mean, this is partly self-interested, I guess, because I teach, I teach DH, I have that, you know, kind of fun job of trying to teach this really diverse, you know, fragmented discipline. Um, but, but I guess one of the things here is that it's, um, it's also about how, how do we make sure that these kind of methodologies and these approaches that we're, that we're learning within this discipline that we call DH, if, it, if we can call it a discipline, how do we get those out into language? Because, you know, I know that, that for my colleagues teaching in languages, often there's no scope or time or or support for actually teaching a digital methodology so yeah i don't i'm sure you don't have an a, a easy solution yeah. but i mean it can it can go it can go multiple ways i mean they i mean particularly for the courses that are are in a specific language um i mean that can be a little bit of of a harder 
a harder ask. Um, I mean, at least at least at Stanford, many of the courses that we teach in my division, you know, are in English, sort of about literature, practically speaking, in in translation. Um, I mean, like I, I because there are many more people, I think, who are sort of specifically tasked with teaching DH and come from an, an English only background. Um, I mean, they're they're the people I've been trying to uh, target. Um, you know, get, getting getting them to care, um, getting them to at least like be aware that this is an issue and like they, they don't have to like go learn um, these other languages and figure out how it works, but like go ask someone and like care enough to to bother. Um, and in, in terms of, of, you know, resources for people um, working in, you know, Spanish, French, Portuguese, um, programming historian is excellent. I will stick the link in the chat or perhaps um, but they they have um, I, I I really appreciate both um, you know the the tutorials they have I, I I have learned a lot from them I have a number of them like in my bookmarks bar just for my own purposes um, you know but but also the fact that they have um, you know lessons that they accept um, originally in in all the languages that they work in um, and for any of the languages they they encourage people to use examples that aren't just English. Um, which is is great. I personally use examples from Italian um, Harry Potter fanfic in um, my uh, Jupyter Notebook tutorial. That's fantastic. I think Programming Historian is such a great website and it's such a useful tool for people who, you know, are really not sure about the best way to integrate, um, you know, digital tools or methodologies into their courses, especially coming from language department. So uh, thank you for, for that. Um, I think we should probably move on to our next speaker, though. I can't see any other hands up in the chat, but thank you so much, Quinn, for uh, this talk and again for giving this keynote to open our conference. I think it's um, perfectly the right tone and the right amount of information as well to have as we move forward, especially in your time zone in particular. So thank you very much from oh, both you and Katrina. So please thank Quinn for us. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Shabelle El Kaisi, uh, who is a PhD student in linguistics at ANU and whose project examines morphosyntactic change within the nominal paradigm of Syriac. Uh, I'm very pleased to be on Shabelle's panel, and he's making excellent progress. He's worked in commercial, public, and not for profit sectors, and his PhD. Uh, uses tools from digital humanities. He's talking to us today about the successes and challenges in digital humanities and Syriac. So Shabelle, I can see you've already started sharing the slides. So you're super prepared as always. Hey, yes, super okay. Thanks, Josh. You can hear me okay? Just, yes. I assume, yeah, okay. All right, beautiful. Thanks again, Josh. Um, and thanks, Quinn, for um, opening up. That was definitely illuminating for me. Um, as Josh sort of mentioned, I use digital humanities uh, tools and techniques in my PhD research, which is um, in the historical syntax of Aramaic. And I was hoping today to sort of give an overview of um, how the, the, the field of Syriac in the digital humanities emerged. Um, I'll point out three key successes um, uh, of Syriac in the DH and also give a brief overview of some bottlenecks. Um, so by way of, ooh, uh, let me get rid of, there we go. Okay, so by way of background, um, what is Syriac um, is a good place to start. So Syriac is a, is a dialect of the Aramaic language. It's a dead dialect. Um, there are uh, many, uh, well, there are still some uh, dialects of Aramaic spoken today in endangered communities throughout the Middle East and in diaspora communities. Um, but the Syriac dialect in particular um, was, is mostly attested between the second and eighth centuries. And like uh, classical Greek or Latin or Sanskrit, it's um, it developed into a classical language, which means it's a sort of prestigious variety um, with a unique uh, literary tradition, and it has a very large body of literature spanning many genres, 
uh, medical, philosophical, legal, political, historical, etc. Um, so, paraphrasing Harold Innes from Theo Monte's paper, um, the Syriac and the Digital Humanities wasn't born in a vacuum, um, and it can actually be helpful to understand the cultural foundation from which it emerged from. Um, this is what otherwise known as the cultural law um, as cited in Fiormonte. So in terms of uh, Syriac and the Digital Humanities, or the SDH, um, it's, it can be argued to actually be an early adopter of the digital humanities field. I mean, this is debatable depending on when we want to draw the line um, uh, at which DH actually emerged. Um, but in any case, it more or less began with efforts to develop Syriac fonts um, by George Karaz, who was an engineer um, and who founded a company in LA in the late 80s. Um, the fonts weren't actually released um, until 12 years later in, in the year 2000, but this nonetheless uh, sort of uh, got the ball rolling um, in the field. George Cruz later did his PhD research in um, Semitic computational morphology. Um, he used a lot of lexemes in the Syriac New Testament to uh, establish a concordance. And then this uh, snowballed into uh, a database um, that incorporated other non-biblical texts. Um, and then this sort of amalgamated into what's today known as the Syriac Institute, um, which George Cruz still runs. And this you know, um, hosts a whole range of DH uh, initiative tools and uh, platforms um, from archives to um, uh, uh, keyboards, mobile phone keyboards for um, Aramaic, modern Aramaic speakers, uh, etc. So moving on to the uh, successes. Um, a key success um, is uh, archiving practices. Um, we have here um, a snapshot of the top 20 digital uh, storehouses um, of Syriac, digitized Syriac records. It's obviously impossible to fully capture the exact number, but um, impressionistically, there's close to 10,000. Um, Fiormonte mentions this sort of archiving fever that grips the DH field. And I think this is very much the case in uh, Syriac in the digital humanities. Um, a separate platform um, uh, known as Syriac um, uh, provides a comprehensive bibliography of digitized Syriac text. Un unlike this table presented here, it aims to present a unique list. Um, and there they list about two and a half to 3,000 records. So the fact that there's close to 10 across over 20 organizations is highly suggestive of um, overlapping digitization efforts um, and this sort of non-centralized approach, which I think is problematic um, because it creates a sort of, uh, well, it can be very chaotic, at least for me as a researcher in terms of deciding where to, where to begin. Um, uh, nonetheless, a second success uh, is textual corpora. There are two main uh, corpora in the field of Syriac. Um, both listed here in a very sort of nice way. They are kind of, um, th these two platforms are, are a sort of nice metaphor of the competing interests between quality and quantity, um, which researchers, uh, I guess, always have to sort of uh, balance. Um, on the left, the simple corpus, um, uh, its advantage is its size uh, with about 30 million words spanning 600 texts across many centuries, authors and genres. But where it makes up in size, it loses in terms of quality. And that's because um, the OCR and HDR technology that is used to bulk convert digitized text into text format comes with an error rate um, and it's not human proof. Um, and so it's not necessarily fit for research purpose. Um, on the other hand, the digital Syriac corpus sort of uh, counteracts this with uh, human transcription and some proofing, but um, because that's obviously quite um, labor intensive, they have about half the amount of text um, compared to SIMSOR. Um, and 
Even then, only 20% of those are currently available. The final success of the field, uh, and I would sort of be inclined to argue that uh, CELAC is uh, sort of, if not pioneering, maybe really leading the way in terms of the um, exemplar model, um, would be in terms of metatextual resources and specifically creating um, an intellectual infrastructure for CIRAC and the digital humanities. Um, in particular, um, the field benefits from a platform called Syriaca.org. This is a sort of cyber infrastructure, so to speak. Um, the vision here is that wherever um, uh, something related to Syriac is available anywhere on the web, uh, particularly uh, relating to a Syriac text, um, it would hyperlink back to this platform. Um, and this platform is quite um, uh, sort of um, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, far reaching in that it contains for any, you know, any one single text, it can tell us um, a whole heap of stuff about it, um, whether that be geographical, uh, biographical in terms of the author, uh, archaeological in terms of how the text or how an inscription, for instance, is found. Um, and so naturally it's uh, interdisciplinary in nature. And I think the, the, the beauty here is that, um, at least for me as a researcher, um, it makes important philological and metatextual information more transparent and accessible to me. So I'm able to know um, who the author of a particular text is, but also uh, where they were born, where they were educated, um, uh, perhaps, uh, where they died. And this um, is helpful to me in terms of uh, adducing, for instance, the exact dialect of um, the uh, text in question. Um, I'll quickly breeze through the challenges because uh, I realize I might be going a bit over time um, uh, soon, but one bottleneck relates to font development for marginalized script varieties. So we have here on screen an example of a Garshuni manuscript, um, uh, and specifically a Lebanese Garshuni manuscript. Garshuni here refers to a mixed script variety where um, in you know, sort of an oversimplified way, you have Syriac uh, letters or characters at, at the base and Arabic diacritics overlaid onto that. Um, and currently, to the best of my knowledge, um, Unicode font um, does cater to this uh, sort of marginalized uh, variety. And so um, there's potentially a lot of rich um, uh, um, information that um, in terms of human writing practices that's being overlooked because of this. Um, there has been some efforts by the Syriac Institute to have Unicode font developed uh, for these sorts of marginalized varieties. Um, and the Syriac Malayalam um, variety comes to mind uh, for speakers, yeah, Malayalam speakers in India. Um, so there's been some efforts, but it's, um, I guess, I'm probably a matter of time before um, other varieties like Lebanese does really get folded into um, the mix. The final bottleneck relates to pod tagging or part of speech tagging. I'm happy to speak about this more in question time if it's of interest, but uh, basically this is, in my opinion, probably the uh, biggest um, sort of thorn in the side of Syriac and digital humanities because of the fact that um, as I mentioned, George Price did his PhD in Semitic Computational Morphology um, uh, over 30 years ago now. And um, even with the sort of uh, develop, development of the age of the field and computational linguistics, there's, there's been no breakthrough at all in um, uh, post tagging um, uh, Aramaic text, Syriac text, um, and many other Semitic languages, in fact, suffer. Um, from poor or inaccurate post tagging um, um, efforts. Uh, this is actually, I, in my opinion, it's, a, it's more of a theoretical issue because uh, theoretical linguistics still doesn't have a good way to pass semantic morphology just because of its nonlinear nature. Um, but that's something I'm happy to uh, speak about. Um, in Q&A if it's of interest. So in summary, the SDH field um, is 
probably an early adopter of digital humanities uh, relative to other non-Anglo languages. Um, it sort of um, really got under its belt the archiving, the corpora and advanced text searching and the cyber infrastructure um, resources or tools. Um, some challenges to overcome in the future are um, centralizing archiving efforts, or at least standardizing them, um, developing some marginalized varieties, and as I've just discussed, pod tagging. So thanks for, uh, thanks for listening. Sorry if I went over time, Josh. Um, and yeah, happy to take any questions. Thanks, Shabelle. That was fantastic. It's, I think you're just a few minutes over, but it's really great to have this overview as well of Syriac and how it's helped you in your research and, and um, the kind of different resources that are available for different languages. It's you know, clearly there's a lot out there and you've been able to take advantage of it. So mm. I take my hat off to you. Well done. Um, do people have questions for Chabelle either in the chat or if they raise their hand, then they can also ask uh, ask verbally. What do you see as the next step? If I will ask a question, if anybody else does. Yeah. Sure. What What do you see as the next step? Would you say in Yeah in corpus building for Syriac, because it seems like there's a lot of metatextual information, as you say, there's a lot of databases that are already available online. Yeah. And well, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. I think I um, recently watched a, I attended a conference um, where George Krav mentioned plans to sort of uh, develop the simple corpus further, they, and they, They've actually, um, they intend to, I mean, originally they use transcribers, which I know you're familiar with Josh, to uh, uh, convert yeah, images to text format, but they've switched over to a, a different um, service provider now that apparently um, is supposed to yield higher quality uh, conversion rates. And um, I guess the, the, the plan here is to make the current corpus of 13 million words uh, actually fit for research purposes. Whereas currently, I would say it's probably in its beta stage, even though it's not advertised like that. Um, and I guess probably more into the, the far future, I mean, that's more near future. Uh, far future, um, I, I would um, imagine that there would be some sort of effort to merge the Syriac dialect with um, corpora um, of other Aramaic dialects because I mean the Aramaic language itself has been attested for at least uh, 3,000 years. Syriac captures about five or six or seven hundred of that so and there has already been efforts to digitize older varieties of Aramaic so somehow merging all that and having a corpus of language of a single language that's uh, developed over multiple thousand years, I think would, would sort of be the holy grail of uh, DH. Um, Fantastic. <laughs> Sounds, yeah. you know, that's interesting to think about those things. Uh, I can see Quinn has her, has their hand up as well, so. Yeah, I, I, was, I was just curious um, if you have a sense for um, whether some of the like neural net based technological developments have, have made any sort of improvements at all with um, Syriac? I know with, with some languages and, and tasks, I mean, including OCR, that was that was a massive leap forward in, in improving the quality mm. of, of things. Was, was, there, was there sort of a part of the workflow that that, that kind of technological change ended up helping with? Or, or like, were those pieces already pretty well in place or like challenging enough that it hasn't really done much? Yeah. Uh... So in terms of um, image to text conversion, I understand that um, the tools were already in place for, um, for, for Syriac. And I, I mean, you're probably familiar with um, Sketch Engine, which provides a platform for um, basically, um, I mean, hundreds of human languages. And I, I think Syriac, um, or the simple corpus uh, takes advantage of that 
platform in order to facilitate um, advanced text analysis and advanced corporate searches. Um, but in terms of POS tagging, um, I am familiar with um, one recent um, uh, um, project. Uh, in fact, I, I contributed Syriac data to this project, and this project used um, a range of uh, artificial intelligence models, including neural networks, to um, uh, to automate the uh, morphological passing of Syriac words. Um, and it failed tremendously. Um, it was actually quite impressive how low the accuracy score was. There are problems, there, I mean, th there are so many reasons for this. I mean, part of it's practical, a practical um, one in terms of the amount of data that's used and the project itself wasn't focusing on Syriac alone. It was more uh, comparing um, morphology across languages, um, but um, I mean, among of the among many other sort of um, theoretical issues that uh, semeticists um, even have to deal with is the fact that, um, and I mean, I've, I've pulled this image up um, on the screen. So um, when when you when I'm reading Aramaic text, they um, uh, typically don't include vocalic information, or they typically exclude vowels. And what this means is that it increases the number of translations there could be for a particular word. Um, so this particular word on screen um, could mean established, remaining, rise, stand, lasting, alive, abiding. Like, uh, and it, it re requires um, knowledge of both grammar, syntax, and surrounding context in order to, to really understand, so to really pinpoint uh, what what word it is, what its meaning is, and its grammatical information. And I think um, this is probably one out of many unique challenges that semantic morphology um, uh, is facing. Um, uh, and, and as well as other, I mean, semantic languages aren't the only one that have non-concatative or non-linear morphology. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, probably representative of a broader issue in that regard. Yeah, so I hope I asked your question. I sort of went off on a bit of a tangent there. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's it's always good to hear. Um, there's a, a classical Arabic team working on the Princeton project and, and, and I know they've, they've been having a, yeah. a great time with morphology too. So. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, look, I, you've sort of, uh, I mean, the, the classical languages, they take, well, this is sort of an interesting point. So in, in, my, in my understanding, uh, the biblical texts have really um, helped classical languages in a way where, you know, I look, for instance, in Syriac, um, uh, there's been thousands of words that have been passed for grammatical information by humans um, of primarily biblical texts. And um, so if, uh, and so and typically a corpora in Syriac, like in classical Arabic, tends to be of a religious nature. So if it's not the Quran, it might be the New Testament. Um, and because there's been so much work done on these texts for, for centuries, the, the quality tends to be quite good. Uh, the moment you try to um, generalize that to other Arabic texts or other Syriac texts um, that may be more colloquial um, or um, just a slight dialectal variety, the accuracy just sort of crashes. So, um, yeah, it, it is a it is a scalability problem, um, I think. Um, Thanks, Shabelle. I think we might have to leave it there, but uh, this was yeah. fascinating. So thank, thank you very much for that. That's that's great to have. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we're we're just a little bit late for time, but I think it's going fine. Our next speakers are um, Simon Musgrave and Peter Sefton, both at the University of Queensland. Uh, I saw their names just before. Are there, Simon? Yep, we're here. Oh, you're there? Okay, I can hear. Oh, now I can see you. Fantastic. Hi, good to see you. And uh, Peter as well. I think I saw his name before. Yeah, I'm here. Ah, oh, great. Hi, Peter. Great. Uh, the title of their presentation is Infrastructure for Multilingual Text Analysis. And I won't say anything else. Thank you so much to both of you for 
for presenting today. So over to, to you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for having us. Um, this is maybe seems like a kind of boring aside in fascinating discussion of the kinds of research we can do across languages. But I hope we're going to persuade you that actually thinking about what kind of infrastructure we're basing our work on is important and is relevant. And also that current um, efforts to build research infrastructure for the humanities in Australia are taking into consideration the kind of problems and issues that we're discussing in the conference today. So I'm going to start by talking briefly about why research infrastructure is important in this area. As we know, and as Chabelle has just mentioned already, collecting data takes time and it costs money, and we really need to think about it being reusable. It's a shame to spend a lot of time and money creating a nice data set that then sits on somebody's hard drive forever and nobody else can get near it. So we're starting from the from a basic philosophical outlook that reshare, sharing and reusing data is something we should all be aiming to do. Of course, we want to respect whatever rights people might hold in their data in that process, but to the extent that it's possible, and to the extent that the FAIR principles and the CARE principles allow us to do it, we want to share data. And even if you're just working with a small data set of your own, over time, this becomes an onerous business. To what extent are you going to transform your data when technology changes? To what extent are you going to have to manage making data available on a different server if you move from one institution to another? All of these things are problems that come up if you're managing your own data. They're not insoluble, but they're not the kind of problems that we necessarily want to be dealing with when we'd, be, we'd rather be you know, pursuing the, the mysteries of non-concatenative morphology in Semitic languages. So maybe using infrastructure, which is separate from the researchers, is a good solution to this. And we want to suggest that actually there are other advantages besides reducing the burden on the individual researcher by locating data with infrastructure to look after it. First of all, the data will be fairer. The infrastructure will be built along those principles. Stuff will be findable, stuff will be accessible, it will be as interoperable as possible, it will be as reusable as possible, because that's what the infrastructure is aiming to do. When people build infrastructure, they are also building expertise in data management. And as individuals, it's hard for us to achieve that level. So if we can pull on that level of expertise to help our data being made more accessible and usable, that's got to be a good thing. And also, I think there are real advantages in terms of technology change. We know how fast technology changes. If an infrastructure organisation is concerned with that, they're doing it on scale. They're looking at good migration pathways. It's not something you need to worry about for yourself any longer. So these are some of the kind of reasons why I think anybody working with language data or any data wants to think about using research infrastructure to support what they're doing. Currently in Australia, we're building a piece of research infrastructure around research based on language data called the Language Data Commons of Australia. Uh, this is a project which has been in gestation for several years now. It's led by Professor Michael Hall from the University of Queensland and kind of grows out of his previous work with the Australian National Corpus Project, but it's now a more wide ranging kind of project. Uh, it's now a funded project through the Australian Research Data Commons. I'm not gonna read out our, our vision or whatever statement you wanna call it on the screen, you can read that for yourselves. But the crucial thing that we wanna emphasize here is that this project wants to make accessible language data for language use in Australia. And that doesn't just mean English. And I'll get to the details of that in a second. It, this is a kind of mixed model that we're trying to develop where in some cases we're going to provide 
access to existing resources through a federated discovery system. In other cases, we'll be acting at least for a limited term as a repository in our own right. But we're making, trying to make language data as accessible as possible to researchers. As I said previously on the previous slide, we're aiming to store data about language use in Australia. Now, Australia is a multilingual society. In the 2016 census, we have over 300 languages being used by people in their homes in Australia. And over 20% of the population speak a language other than English at home. That's a lot of language going on. Um, I didn't add in there, but of course, there, are, there were at least 250 distinct languages spoken at the time of European arrival. And half of those are still spoken to some extent. So there's a lot of language happening in Australia. So if we're gonna meet the aim of storing data about language use in Australia, we have to be able to handle data from multiple languages, from multiple writing systems, and with all sorts of different kinds of annotations. It's, um, it's good at this point to note that both the previous talks have referred to problems with Unicode. So Quinn mentioned that for Burmese data, she encountered different possibilities which were not entirely supported by Unicode. Charbel mentioned the mixed, uh, mixed notations in the manuscripts he was looking at, which are not supported by Unicode. So we, we all know that there are things that Unicode will not handle, but even the things that we expect Unicode should in principle handle, we can ex also expect that problems may come up. So what we're gonna talk about today is what we've tried to do so far to test whether those problems are going to be encountered with the technological development which we're aiming to make. So I'm now going to hand over to Petey to talk about the architecture that we're working with. Okay, so the um, the technical architecture that we've got to, to support the, the, the aims that Simon was talking about um, is not particular to language data at all. Um, I do have a PhD from a linguistics department and I phrased that fairly carefully there, um, that statement. <laughs> Um, but um, I've been working as an e-research manager um, and dealing with data from also like from a comprehensive university of, with science data and all sorts of other things. Um, and one of the problems we have is uh, when funding comes, like the funding we've got from the Australian Research Data Commons, people tend to build vertical applications. Um, you know, in the language world, you might have corpus tools. Um, and they don't live very long. Software is um, is ephemeral. You know, it, it can't be supported for the long term. Usually languages come and go, you get security problems. Um, and after a lot of dealing with that, um, there are standards emerging from the digital library community um, for which actually recognize this and try and work from the, from the data up. So the architecture that we have is based on a, a repository technology called the Oxford Common File Layout, which comes from Oxford and a number of other universities, including uh, Stanford and some other US institutions, where the digital library people, mostly from academic libraries, have uh, come up with a way of um, having repositories that might underlie uh, research tools and workspaces that are based on uh, files and, uh, and, and or object storage, um, where you make sure you get that bit right and those things are, um, are sustainable. And on top of that, we're using a, a standard, which again is not, ling not language specific or um, humanity specific called Research Object Crate, um, which is a way of describing objects. And so that could be a, a, a linguistic item or a, um, a biological workflow or some microscope slides or you know, anything. Um, and we're using standards to um, uh, we use a link data standards, which means we can import ontologies and vocabularies from from anywhere. So we can you can have language specific, um, in our case, uh, vocabularies that help you talk about different kinds of language. Is it a dialogue or not? Um, is it written or spoken? Is it signed? Those sorts of things. And then on top of that, we build um, a, an, an index of that data, which allows data access. 
including, very importantly, making sure that we we don't give the wrong data to the wrong people because language necessarily involves human participants. So everything is stored with a license and we have um, authentication and authorization services that we're building that will allow us to identify the right groups of people having access to data, which often is you have to be in a research team um, uh, to under the ethics agreements under which some of the data was collected. So we're, we're building portals, which we'll show a quick screenshot of in a second. Um, but the idea is that we know that's just, that won't last forever, that particular portal technology, but we want to make sure that the data in the repository is stored as a series of very well described files using standards. Want to go on, Simon? Okay, so we're going to uh, next do a very quick demo to show where we're up to at this stage. Um, the material we're looking at here is some government documents, as many of you may be aware. Each level of government in Australia, federal, state and local, makes documents available in multiple languages in many cases. So we've taken a small group of those from uh, Services Australia and from the Victorian Department of Health and selected documents that were all available in each of these five languages. Uh, we chose these five languages because they're five, five different writing systems and three and a bit completely different systems. So Turkish and Vietnamese use an extended Roman script, uh, Arabic and Farsi is a version of an Arabic script and Chinese is completely distinct. And uh, Petey's going to tell you about how this works. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a, um, a prototype. So this is this is work in progress showing uh, what a la the Language Data Commons um, website will look like. And it's a fairly self-explanatory thing here with a, a Chinese language search going on here, um, which gets you to the Chinese version of the English Australian Australian government document, so the, the translation. Um, and while that's playing, which you can see, um, there's a few interesting points here. So the research object crate standard, the RO crate, um, is an international collaboration, and I'm one of the editors of that. Um, the other editor is Norwegian, and there's a lot of European um, participation in that from a wide variety of countries. But it's all conducted in English, and all our metadata so far has been English, in English, which is not surprising given that most of the people involved are scientists and they conduct everything in English so that that wasn't questioned. But the technologies we're using do actually allow for multilingual support. So the, um, the JSON linked data, JSON LD standard, lets you have multiple languages in the same metadata documents. Um, and the platform that we're using, using with Unicode supports, um, the, at least the mainstream languages that are, that are uni that Unicode covers, so we have potentially good support for a large number of languages, but we haven't actually had the development on that. Um, we haven't actually had people implementing uh, multilingual systems. So we're going to start to do that and we'll feed that back into the, um, to the standard so that people can conduct research on, lang on languages other than English in languages other than English. And just to finish, I want to mention the kind of sources of data that uh, we see as being possible for the Language Data Commons of Australia, other than English and other than Indigenous languages. Uh, for a start, there are enormous numbers more government documents. And I think this is a really interesting area because what we're looking at here is a very parallel corpus across multiple languages, which is a fantastic research tool. If anybody's interested in exploring this idea, please get in touch. There are also serial publications in various languages from Australia over its history. Tim Sherratt, on whose indefatigable work we all rely at some point, has found that there are 52 non-English sources in the Trove collection. Uh, more than half of those were published before 1945. I picked 1945 here as a, you know, a kind of breaking point because this was the big post-war, post-World War II migration to Australia. So, you know, significant numbers even before that. German language material is prominent in the 19th century. 
And not surprisingly, after 1945, there's a lot of Italian and Greek. Chinese has been here forever. So there's a lot of material that's there that people can access. And in general, the use of languages other than English in Australia is an under-researched field. And to give you a, a flavour of the kind of stuff that has been done and could be done, there's some fantastic research that was done oh, 20 years ago now, I think, about generational or differences in the use of Vietnamese between different generations of migrants. So the ones who came in the 1970s have a different variety of Vietnamese than the ones who came later. And there's interesting tensions that emerge within the community when that happens. That kind of research has not been replicated for other communities, and there's a huge range of other possibilities. And as I, we mentioned, our work is funded by the Language Data Commons of Australia. We mentioned so through two of their programs, and we're also very grateful to our wonderful software developer, Moise Sakal Bonacqui. Thank you. I'd just like to add, we'll, we will um, write up some notes with this, including any discussion that happens right now, um, and publish this uh, as a web page with all the slides and, and some commentary. Um, and we'll send that through to part so that's available after the um, after the session in a couple of days. That would be wonderful. Thanks so much. Thanks to both. Thanks, Simon and Peter. This is a, a huge project and very, very interesting. I mean, it's fascinating to see how you've gone about it and to think about the languages that you've chosen as well. Um, it's obviously a, you know, a valuable resource for many, many sectors of Australian society, but not only. So it's great to see these kind of projects happening in our own backyard, so to speak, as well. We're just a little bit over time, uh, but perhaps if there's a, a one or two questions. Um, if people would like to ask Simon or Peter anything at this stage. Will people be able to upload their own document, Simon, to this interface, or is it purely for documents that have already been stored in other repositories? We're not restricting ourselves to documents that have been stored in other repositories, but it will be a mediated process. So we would expect that we would be contacted by or get in contact with data stewards or custodians and start discussions about how and when and then they might want to make their data available or discoverable within our project. Okay. It's not going to be a kind of um, oh, what um, what's a, I never remember the right social media platforms. It's not going to be something where you just upload your photos and have everybody see them. It's it's going sure. to be a more curated process than that. But that said, the technical stack would support that if you know if people want to have those kinds of repositories running on the same <laughs> infrastructure, uh, you, we can do that. Okay, good to know. Thank you. We, also, there's a there's a thing I didn't talk about on the architecture slide, which is the Australian Text Analytics platform, where people will be able to consume data, um, subject to having a life, being licensed to do so, and um, have notebooks, code that they develop that processes that data. And they will be able to deposit um, the code and possibly some of the outcomes of that back into a repository. Probably not the LDACA repository, the Language Data Commons repository, but there will be one for the Australian Text Analytics platform, which is the products of the research and the code used to do the research. Great. Um, how, what, what's the community, like the research community, like in terms of embracing this infrastructure? I know that's always the sort of hot topic with infrastructure, especially in the humanities, where it's the idea of, of you know, having data repositories is still kind of, you know, a new, newish thing to some, to some researchers. So what's it like in, in, in terms of this, this one? It's, that's a, it's a great question, Katrina, and it's a very hard question to, to answer. We're kind of six months into the project. So what you've seen today is kind of what we can offer people at the moment, and that's not very much. We're not going to entice a lot of people to use our services with that. So um, uptake we have to work on over time. Uh, I think, though, I'd like to pick up on what Petey said a moment ago, 
of the possibility that people will be able to save their work into a repository. That's one of the selling points or one of the nudges we'd like to give to researchers in Australia, the idea that if you're using this kind of research approach and these kind of processes, having well-documented objects at the end of it is an advantage. It's part of what you do and it's a huge advantage. And if you think, for example, of the journals, which now want you to show where data is accessible to back up your claims, this is the kind of way that research is going to develop. Um, uh, just, very, just very quickly, we actually already have, um, so I, I was um, involved in the Albio uh, project, which was similar to this, building a large um, collection of language resources. And basically nobody used that. It was a couple of million dollars that was not very well spent. Um, although we did learn a number of lessons. So in this project, we're taking much more, um, paying much more attention to making sure that we develop the research use cases and and hold hands for people with people to, to get stuff done. And we've had some early success loading in a corpus called Sydney Speaks, from um, which from Professor Catherine Travis at ANU. Um, and we have ingested, done at least a preliminary ingest of that data and worked with an honest, pre-honest student um, to do some analysis on the dialogues in that. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's ongoing work that Catherine's overseeing. Um, and because we have this common repository architecture where we've ingested the, the, the dialogues, the recordings and the transcripts, um, we can scale the code that the student has, um, has developed to work with other similarly structured data sets. And we have some others that are in the, uh, are being loaded into Aldaca. So, we, this is something that would be very difficult to do if you're dealing with ad hoc data that's, even if it's in a common repository, if it hasn't been a lot, if you don't have you know, standards for the metadata, um, then everything you do, you have to write a new piece of adapter code and working across uh, collections is difficult. So we have had some early success with enabling that and that's the kind of thing we'll continue to do. That's great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> good luck. <laughs> uh, it's just gone past uh, 3 p.m. in Canberra. I can see it's seven past. So thank you, Simon and Peter. That's fantastic to hear that kind of work going on. And thanks to all of our speakers in this first session as well, to Quinn in particular, and also to Chabelle. Uh, I think it's been a great way to open this session. And I think we'll have like 23 minutes or so of break now. Yeah. Yeah. Is that right, Katrina? That's and then right. come back, back at half session. past half past three for me, but yeah, half past whatever the hour is in your time zone. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great. See you yeah. soon. stick to our timetable um, and, and maximize time for discussion and questions. Um, so yeah, welcome back to the second session. Uh, just a reminder for anyone who's joined us since we started the last session that we are recording these sessions. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. And, and if you're one of the presenters and you, you don't want your talk recorded, just let us know and DM us in the chat or, or send Josh or I a quick email. Um, but yeah, with that, we'll, we'll get back into it. So uh, we've got three papers in this session. Um, so we'll go through till, for, I was going to say till 4.30, but I'm con constantly conscious that we're all in completely different time zones. So we'll, we'll, this session will be an hour long. Uh, and we're starting off with a, 
a talk from uh, Samantha Bisbray, Ben Foley, Shruti Rijwani and Meladel Mystica on Reading It Right, a case study in Pintupi Luricha. Um, and they're all uh, from different universities. If I've got this right, Samantha and Ben are from the University of Queensland, Shruti is from Carnegie Mellon and um, Meladel is from the University of Melbourne. So I hope I've got you all rightly affiliated. Um, but yeah, please take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Katrina, and I'll start um, Samantha Disbray here. So the, um, the, oh, Mel, could you person the slides, please, and just flip for me? Thanks. Uh, so the language that we are looking at in the study that we've done is Pindubi Lurcha, which is a Western desert language spoken in Central Australia in the Northern Territory, across several communities and also outside of the sort of Pindubi Lurch heartland uh, in other Central Australian communities with an estimated um, 1,500 speakers. And the data set that we have worked on is a collection of around 73 editions of a newsletter, although we haven't worked on all of them. There, is, there are 73 editions of a newsletter that was produced as part of the Northern Territory Bilingual Education Program at Papunya School in their Literacy Production Centre between 1979 and about 2003. And these community newsletters are written mostly in Pindubi Luritja uh, with translations in English, although some are one or the other. And they cover a range of topics, the material in these newsletters, um, documenting the history of the community and at the time sort of local announcements and news, so fairly um, varied content. And the newsletters were produced with different stages of uh, production methods, right, from Ronios to offset printers to early uh, desktop publishing to, um, and they, it kind of stops at the digital age, really. And so um, this project, the, the, the data in our project were scanned and digitised by the National Library of Australia as part of a, a partnership. And it's part of a broader program of um, uh, archiving, digitising and archiving a very large collection of language materials that were created um, through the bilingual education programs. So to give you an idea of what a page may look like, you just saw a couple of pages on the previous slide. Um, when these were scanned, they were uh, the uh, National Library process included an OCR um, text, which is displayed on trove beside the uh, copies, the images of the original newsletter pages. And our focus has been on the OCR quality, which has um, it, which varies. Uh, as you can see here, um, there's uh, some success with rendering the um, the fonts. And just to point out these. This language, as well as uh, some other Central Australian languages, uh, has opted to use the, um, the symbol of underscore to mark a retroflex sound, so to contrast a couple of sounds among certain consonants. And um, when the community saw these digital newsletters, people were very pleased because they are keen to have access to materials and to be able to repurpose them for teaching and learning languages and other activities in, um, in new ways. However, they were concerned that their language was represented um, erroneously in these OCR texts. So I'm gonna hand over to Mel to talk about what we thought about doing about this. Um, first of all, um, we wanted to point out a couple of other reasons why we might want to correct this trove output. Um, from a, an academic perspective, this collection could be a great data set for those who are studying and working on the language. And from an archival point of view, um, if we want to store this collection for future generations, uh, we can index the corpus more accurately uh, without these character recognition errors that you saw before. So moving on to how we want to um, improve Trove's OCR output for um, Pintupi Lurisha. So we wanted to take a two-stage approach. Um, so given the output that we've seen, it's obvious that Trove's transcription model is not really built for Pintupi Lurisha. So um, we wanted to be able to train our own um, 
OCR transcription model to improve this. Um, and then the next stage would be doing a post-correction uh, model of the output. Um, but this poses um, challenges because this often requires a lot of data. Um, the tool that we're that we used to build this post-correction model uh, was developed especially for low resource settings, which is our setting, and tries specifically to learn the kinds of errors that you'd find in um, OCR transcription, uh, it, at OCR transcribed text. So we've initially started working on um, post-correction models. So I'll just talk about that for the rest of the talk. Um, so the tool is developed by our um, co-author Shruti and her colleagues, and it's an open source tool and it's available to anyone on GitHub. Um, uh, there are two sets of data required for the various stages of building the model. In the pre-training stage, um, we have an extra 460 lines of uncorrected text straight from Trove. Um, there are various phases of pre-training, um, but we use this data um, for building a sequence to sequence model that learns what the source text looks like, errors and all. Um, in the training phase, um, we have two parallel texts, the source text and the target text, um, which are completely different from the 460 lines in pre-training. Um, the source text, um, it comes directly, directly from Trove. Um, it's uncorrected, whereas the target text um, is corrected. And the aim of the training phase is to learn how to correct these errors given um, the source and the, the target text. Now, with this training data, we build two data sets, um, which we call the small data set and the large data set, but actually they're both really small. Um, and so the large data set has less than um, 1,500 words and um, 15,000 characters, and the small data set is just um, a little bit over um, half that size. So we conducted two experiments. Um, five runs of five-fold cross-validation and 10-fold cross-validation on the small and the large data set. Um, the metric we use to um, see improvements above the baseline is the character error rate and the word error rate expressed as a percentage. Now, the baseline is um, the original errors that we've seen in Trove. So we want to try to improve that. But you can see in the small data set, we actually really don't make any improvements above the data set, but correcting just a couple of, a few more pages uh, by creating the large data set, we see that we have an, a 20% increase in CER and a 35% increase in WER. So we just wanna show you a couple of uh, real examples. So um, at the top we have, um, uh, the scanned image. And then below that, we have the Trove OCR output. And you can see that um, Trove is, as um, Samantha had mentioned before, it uh, doesn't render the retroflex consonants properly with the underscore. And we've just, we've highlighted a couple of um, these in, in orange in the OCR output and how we've been able to correct them in our post, with our post correction model. However, our, um, our tool does over overcorrect sometimes, and so you can see in um, Yentolpa the 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 first word in the third line shouldn't have that underscore. So our model has overcorrected there. Um, whoopsie! Here we go. Next line. So here, um, this is an example of like a low quality scan, and so you get like an low quality OCR output from Trove. And you can see it's mostly errors. It's all orange in the OCR output. Um, but you can see in our post-correction model that um, not only are we able to reinstate the underscore, but we're able to correct many of the errors from Trove's OCR output. Um, so we were actually really pleased with that. So we're really pleased with our initial results using post-correction. We know we have a lot more to do, but, um, but the results are looking promising. So yeah, we're very happy. Any questions? Great, thank you. That was really interesting insight into um, working with a small data set. I think it, it's something I, um, if I'm often find myself kind of railing against the obsession with the big big data as the next thing when so much of what we do in, in humanities research is about working with these much smaller data sets and finding solutions to them. Um, uh, yeah, if there's any questions, you can pop them in the chat or, or raise your hand. Um, 
we've got plenty of time for, for discussion. So um, yeah, Quinn, Quinn's got a question, jump in. Yeah, no, that's really interesting to see with the the underscores. Um, yeah, I mean, diacritics are are just such a nightmare to to deal with with OCR. Um, I, I was I was curious if you could say more about um, the example where you managed to go from uh, like the complete like gibberish OCR to um, something meaningful. And I, I was I was curious about the the words that didn't make it and sort of like what like are, are there things that you've discovered about like what it's able to successfully correct from like a state of massive error and what things it it just can't reconstruct so i mean it's a sequence to sequence model so it actually learns everything you know on a character by character basis and that's how it makes the errors as well like by reinstating like you know this underscore when it shouldn't be there but obviously the more often you see the words in the training model or sorry in the training data um, the better the chances are that um, that it will get it right, um, you know, when you're testing it. Um, so really, um, as you could see, it really was, I mean, at this stage, because we're kind of using the tool out of the box, we're actually only relying on how much data we have. Now we can kind of do some further improvements, but um, really a lot of it has to do with, you know, how much data we have <laughs> and what it sees, what the model is seeing. No, that's, that's interesting, thanks. Yeah, yeah. So basically, maybe borrowed words um, will not or like do character well. names or like things like that are, are just not going to do yeah. well. No, no. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, Josh, Josh, you've got your hand up. Thanks. Yeah, I was just wondering, thank you for the presentation about um, how you felt Tesseract worked as a software. Did you find it easy to use or why did you go with Tesseract as opposed to a different type of OCR software? Um, so I think this is a, Ben, are you, are you kind of, are you there? You're a Tesseract, you're the Tesseract man. Um, so we've actually started with um, post, doing our post correction models and we want to combine this at a later stage. But I think Ben, you've used Tesseract before. I was wondering whether you could speak to that. So it was mostly out of a curiosity. Um, over the years, Nick Tiberger and Simon Musgrave have asked me every few years, um, what's the state of the art for Tesseract for this uh, low resource language? And so when there's an opportunity to actually try it, I thought this is the tool for us. Um, I found it uh, quite easy to use, um, but my background maybe prepares me for that. So the way that I did my first uh, experiments with it was to download all of the models that uh, shipped with Tesseract. And then I ran a script that did an ICR uh, for a bunch of sample images using each of the models. And then it compared the results for all of the models. And I did that firstly to see which of the, um, uh, the models that uh, supplied with Tesseract would be the closest to our target. And then from that, I could see which was the one that we would use if we wanted to extend it further. In our focus, we didn't uh, train a new Tesseract model. So we've used an existing model and then we've looked at the post-correction as an approach. Uh, eventually- Which model was that then, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, it's fundamentally it came down to a time and resource question. So I think in the long term, if we had a dedicated program to this, it would be nice to compare the process of training a custom Tesseract model, um, what's involved in tracing out all of the um, and, or hand labeling the training data compared to using uh, an existing model and then fine tuning it. And my gut feeling uh, from working in these uh, low resource language situations is that using an existing big model and then fine tuning it is gonna be a lot less work. And so that's the, uh, that's the place where we put our effort in. So Mel did that to see what we could do with very, without having to train a, a new model. Um, so yeah, I found it easy to use for what we wanted to do with it. Then to actually train a custom model, that would be a, another um, research activity. Thanks. Um, yeah, Simon, you've got a question. It's not so much a question, it's just following up on what Ben said. Um, Nick Teberger and I have been working for a long time on materials from another Australian language, which has a more complex writing script that includes subscripts and superscripts as well as underlines. And 
despite Ben's best efforts to advise us, we, I'm afraid, ended up giving up and having it retyped. <laughs> so I'm going to be interesting to try this approach now. Uh, it so would. I might just mention that uh, Shruti's tool was only published or start, uh, end of 2020. So this is quite a new uh, approach. It's uh, like people doing this type of transfer learning or fine tuning training uh, in image recognition research domain and in speech recognition. Um, but it seems to be quite a new approach for OCR as far as I know. So yeah, it'd be, it would be interesting, especially now that you've got a good big data set to work from Sun. <laughs> Um, we've probably got time for another question if anyone has has a question. I might also just follow up with a uh, question about the error, the types of errors. And I think this would be somewhere else that would warrant further uh, research, uh, further investigation into looking at what the patterns of errors are. So uh, we haven't done an analysis of all of the errors across all of the data set, as in looking at what those patterns are. I think that'd be fascinating to see whether they can be attributed to poor quality scans, or is it a uh, is it a font thing, or is it an image quality thing? Is it a uh, density of text on the page thing? Uh, one of the, um, uh, so Tesseract, oh, and the other um, thing we should point out is that we're not sure I think NLA uses the Abbey Fine Reader software for their OCR, not Tesseract. Uh, but Tesseract works on a line by line approach. And so if you've got a line that has, uh, say, Pinabu literature and then a word of English in there, then it's pretty much guaranteed to not get that English, even if we were to train a mixed model in the post correction state. Uh, it's, it's likely that that English word would always be an error because uh, Tesseract doesn't know about. Uh, multiple languages in a single line. Uh, but doing an error analysis across the whole corpus would be fascinating. I, I think that would be, um, be really nice to see where the clusters of errors are and what they are attributed to. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a really great idea. The other thing is from, um, like, even though from um, a, an OCR perspective, you can't uh, you can't um, build a model on two languages. Uh, one thing that we might want to look at is trying to build like a, an English and a Pintupi Luricha post-correction model and then fine tune on one language. So maybe that's kind of one way to stop, um, you know, the output sort of, you know, choking on one of the languages. Yeah, because it's a common problem with, I mean, I, I work on European sources and people often write in more than one language and it, it trips these models up. And yeah, I'm like 12 months into fine tuning a data set with someone because the people writing use too much Latin. So, yeah, but I was also, because I also, it was interesting you were saying about the density of the text, because I was noticing with your images that I'm assuming that the newsletters would type typed out on a typewriter and it's noticeable that the spaces between the letters are much larger than you know I guess a lot of what what the Trove OCR is working on is newspapers which where it's very very dense text um very close together so yeah interesting to think about how that affects it yeah so in this data set there's a whole range of that there's widely spaced typeset so people putting hot metal lead type into a, um, a grid and printing with ink onto paper oh. is it's from that to people sitting there typing there's handwritten material mm -hmm. in there as well there's the whole gamut it's a fascinating uh, history of the printing uh, industry <laughs> over the last 40 years and this is something we were talking about the other day is that to bring that into the digital age i think is a, there's a nice continuity there of the central australian um, text production being at the cutting edge of uh, printing production and uh, pu publishing technology. So to think that we can contribute by uh, making the OCR data high quality, I think is uh, is a nice sort of thread there as well. Yeah. Great, All right? Thank you. That was really fascinating. Um, we'll move on to our next speaker now. Um, uh, Yuan Jiong uh, Park. Do you have slides to put up? Uh, 
trick of Zoom of, yes, excellent, thank you. Um, yeah, so our next speaker is Yuan Jiong Park uh, from Sunchon National University, and they'll be talking to us about the affordances and challenges of user using learner corpora to multilingual learners writing instructions. So thank you. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me as a presenter. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, as a disclaimer, I tried to shorten my presentation, but if uh, it's uh, All right, where should I do that? Yeah, um, now it works. Can, can you see my full screen? All right, okay. So, um, hi everyone. Um, right, and also uh, thanks very much for Karina and Joshua for inviting me to join this event. And also thanks very much for the previous speakers on their right, uh, great talks or, and also for the group projects. Um, actually, I am sorry about that. I am uh, just a beginner of uh, right, doing the digital humanities. Um, this is a very small project. As you can see, the title of my speech or the talk of the paper is Authorship Attribution of uh, some Chinese martial arts fictions written by one of uh, right, the three great uh, writers of the Chinese martial arts right, uh, using stenometric. Uh, analysis. Um, I'm going to talk about right, the following five uh, parts. First is a very brief introduction that's about why I um, write this paper. And second is about very brief introduction to the literature review. And then I will talk about the design of the research and then results and discussion. So first about why I uh, studied to write this paper. Um, is because in uh, 2018, right, a Chinese um, Lovo, that's English version, that's the legends of the Kondo Hair Rose, was um, published in England. This Lovo was a translation of uh, a Chinese version by written by Jin Yong, um, one of the greatest uh, martial arts fictions uh, in China. Uh, this Lovo, I mean, the legends of the Kondo Hair Rose, Right, was um, well accepted right, worldwide um, among the readers, but also it has won much interest from the media. Right, it was uh, even acclaimed as the a Chinese Lord of the Rings by the Irish Times. Right? The author, right, that's Jin Yong or Louis Cha, he was um, extorted as one of the three um, pioneering novelists of modern martial arts fiction, together with two other ones. That is, uh, the other one is Gu Long and uh, Liang Yusheng. So Gu Long, um, another um, of the three pioneers of modern martial arts fictions, writers, he um, enjoyed a distributed, a disputed reputation. Right? Yeah, he was, um, he was a very productive writer of martial arts fiction, right? more productive than the other two, that's Jin Yong and uh, Liang Yusheng. He acclaimed credit for the authorship of uh, 67 martial arts fictions. Well, in comparison, his counterparts, that's Jin Yong and Liang Yusheng, Jin Yong for about 15 martial arts fictions and Liang Yusheng for uh, 36 martial arts fictions. But um, although Gu Long is very productive in writing the martial arts fiction, he, um, right, he suffered from much criticism, right? First, because of his unsteady style in writing his uh, martial arts fictions. For example, uh, a paper has uh, done a quantitative analysis of his uh, style, the style of the martial arts fiction he's written. And on the other hand, he's also criticized for the ghost writing um, in his um, martial arts fictions. For example, on the website of Gulong's Lovos, uh, there are some study, many textual studies about his um, Ghost writing right, in some of his um, novels. Yet, there's a textual study about Gu Long's uh, uh, martial, fiction, martial, fiction, martial arts fictions, the ghost writing part, where um, seldom were there any stylometric analysis of those ghost written um, martial arts fiction credit to Gu Long. Right? Although there are some analysis, these are mainly textual research on the ghost writing of his. Uh, um, Lovos. 
So um, that's why I want to uh, do a simple analysis right, based on the quantitative uh, data about these um, ghost rating March efficiency credit to Google. And that's why I, I, I did this research. And next, I'm going to move on to a, a brief mention of the nitty rich review of um, um, also attribution. Um, Steinometry, it is also known as a computational linguistic uh, statistics, right? It was actually put forward uh, very early, right? Now it was uh, widely used or applied in corpus linguistic research. Right? Um, Steinometric analysis is based on the quantifiable features and structures of a text to study the style and author's writing habits. Right? Since uh, stylometric methodology has um, made the best of quantifiable data in analysis, it pre presents the study more scientifically. So it is widely used for many topics of humanities, right? such as style analysis, plagiarism detection, and also authorship uh, attribution. For example, in style analysis, there are many research, many scholars doing, right? Um, Right, stylometric analysis right, for the style analysis, right, such as um, Clauser and so on. The uh, um, sorry, sorry to interrupt. We're just um, noting uh, we can still just see your first slide on the screen. I'm not sure if you've moved on really? to. Oh, We're I have moved. Still just see the sorry. title oh. slide. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> sorry about sorry about that. I, I actually sorry. have moved quite a few quite a few yeah. <laughs> slides. Let me see. Is it? Um, yeah. Now we can see. How, how about now? Uh, uh, can you, can you see the, the the slide on um, literature yeah. review? Literature review. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can see that. All right, all right. Sorry, sorry about sorry about that's that's. Oh, that's, that's all right. No, that's fine. That's a technical problem. <laughs> uh, it must first time to use Zoom to to do that. So sorry about that. Um. Okay. Um. So um. For style analysis, there are many scholars. They use this this uh, standard methodology to analyze the style of uh, some literary works. For example, one of the uh, the studies the um have experimented on several methods, um, such as random forest classification, Barron's Delta, and so on, to determine the characteristic features based on the style st statistic counts of the lexical items, right? and so on. Some other scholars, for example, Melka and so on, they have um, used the, the linguistic features, such as uh, vocabulary richness indexes, right, like the uh, TTR, MATTR, and activity, and so on, to um, uh, examine the style of uh, literary work, and so on. Right. Um, in terms of authorship attribution, right, there are also a lot of uh, studies. Right. The uh, statistics of various linguistic features has been uh, computed and examined right, in um, authorship attribution analysis, and also various methods have been applied in the analysis. Right. For example, in terms of uh, the linguistic features right, examined or um, looked at in their research, including um, function words right, or the collocation of vocabulary richness, significant words, letter frequency distribution, word frequency, right, uh, or very common words, less common words, lemma, significant digits, and so on. So uh, these um, links features are often computed right, in authorship attribution. Uh, well, in terms of methods used in the authorship attribution, uh, also uh, various methods have been applied. For example, PCA analysis, that's principal component analysis, or Barron's Delta, or SVM, that's linear support vector machines, and so on. So these different methods are applied in um, authorship attribution analysis. But so, uh, for example, these different analysis, um, different scholars, they use the, these uh, methods and will compute the uh, linguistic features in their uh, style analysis or the authorship attribution. Right. Um, these studies, um, they were mainly concerned with the, um, I mean, the authorship attribution, right? Concerned with the Indo-European languages, especially English. Of course, there are some studies uh, doing other languages, but the, um, the main part should be English. Other languages like Chinese and some other languages were not much examined as the English language. So uh, this paper, that's also why I have tried to uh, do uh, an authorship analysis of this uh, 
Gulong's logo, right? Based on we're using some kind of NLP technology. Right? Um, that's um, third. I want to talk about the research design of uh, this this paper. Um, first, about the research research question. Uh, many two questions. First one is: Is there any style inconsistency in the selected right uh, martial arts fictions? Credit to the famous Chinese uh, right Lowenist writer like Wu Long. Right. Um, second is um, what I want to right, discuss is what linguistic factors examined in the study are most effective in attributing authorship of the um, several MAFs right, in the study. That's the main two questions I want to discuss in this paper. And then um, in this paper, I have um, built a very um, small data set right, right, of five MAFs credit to uh, Gulong, um, nearly 850,000 tokens. Uh, these um, right, texts are, were, were downloaded from the website of Gulong's uh, Lovos. And then um, after I have downloaded the right, data, I uh, processed the data, many use um, the Python script, for example, cleaning the uh, meta information, deleting the blank lines and so on, and also some extra spaces right, and, and some other um, some other unnecessary information, right? Cleaned, and then uh, did uh, POS tagging, words segmentation, and so on. So this is prepare the um, data for analysis, and then in the um, analysis, I use several tools. Right? Um, the first one is right, Python, which I used to uh, use this for collect the data from the website, right? and then clean the data. And also I use this for a PCA analysis, and also use it to uh, extract some features. Right? Besides, I also use the um, R, which I use it for clustering, and then, and then use it for visualization of the results. Besides, I also use the R to uh, compute the uh, dependence distance of the, um, uh, the, the, the five MFs I have uh, chosen in a study. Uh, apart from this two, I've also uh, used two other um, softwares, which is a uh, common knowledge as uh, um, copper so softwares. One is a uh, blank box and the other one is wordless. I use these two tools for uh, computing the average word length, average sentence length, um, moving average tap token ratio, and also standards tap token ratio, as well as um, paragraph uh, lens. Uh, why I use, uh, why I mix these uh, tools together, because I am, I'm just a beginner. I haven't um, been very familiar with um, uh, one of the tools. So I need to combine all them together right, for uh, the study. And then on the, um, about the methods of uh, analysis, of course, it's mainly quantitative analysis based on the stylometric computing of the linguistic features. And then um, I also, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, use them, um, right, uh, Python for PCA analysis. And then based on the um, PCA analysis, I did um, a hierarchical clustering using uh, R, right? So that's about the um, method of analysis. And, and then before I move on to the results and discussion, here's a brief um, description of the statistics of the copper data I used in the uh, study. I have chosen five uh, logos, um, credit to Google, but these five logos are um, commonly right, as partly or partially being written by other writers, which uh, use the word ghost written. So partially ghost written. Um, as we can see, we got five logos, that's TSH, uh, ABH, TSR, LSG, and ASAE. So according, some on, according to some online source, um, all the five um, logos are partially written by other writers uh, than uh, Guno himself. Um, for example, the first one, TSH, according to some online sources, 85% of this novel was uh, written by other, uh, another writer. Um, since there are 60 chapters for this one, 85% um, that means 51 chapters were written by another writer. Right? And similarly to the second one, 
BH, according to some online source, um, 40, 67% were written by another writer. So that is to say 21 chapters out of 32 right, were written by, uh, were ghost written by another writer. And also similarly to a GSR, 17 chapters out of 41 were written by another writer. And five out of 20 were written by another writer for LSG and also SAE, right? 60%, that's two chapters out of 40 chapters were written by another writer. So this is a brief um, uh, mention of the or description of the corporate data. And then that's about the um, methods or methodology and then um, about the results of the uh, study. I need to share with you is um, in um, the analysis, right? I choose uh, several um, linguistic features so that for indicators, the indicators examined in the study include uh, such aspects as vocabulary diversity, um, syntactic um, complexity, uh, dependence relation, right, and so on. So specifically, um, the indicators include a a w l. Uh, STTR, MATTR, POS of content words and function words, uh, lexical density, activity, that's the number of verbs and adjectives, right? Uh, that should be the number of verbs divided by the number of verbs and adjectives, right? And also uh, ASL, right? Average sentence lens and paragraph lens, dependency distance. Um, apart from these two, uh, uh, the previous ones, I also did a sentiment analysis and text similarity, right? as well as the multiple features based on the previous uh, indicators. So for each indicator, I computed the statistics with the tools mentioned earlier and visualized the raw results in bar charts, and then uh, did a hierarchical clustering with, with R right? for the POS of content words and function words. Um, I computed the frequency first and then um, did a PCA analysis to reduce the dimensions since content words include nouns, verbs, adjectives, and so on. So I need to um, reduce these um, dimensions into one or two dimensions and then cluster the PCA results based on the um, one or two dimensions reduced through PCA analysis. And for the multiple features, which contain all the individual indicators and some other indicators computed with the software, word list, many the frequency of words and sentences with different lengths, right? And we did a PCA analysis uh, for the multiple features to reduce the dimensions um, into two dimensions and then cluster it with, um, with the hierarchical clustering. So that's basically how um, the results is uh, computed were produced. And uh, here you can see the for for each um, language feature of which indicator. First, I um, visualize this in bar charts and also and then right cluster. So here I just listed the results of the clustering since um, there are about twelve or thirteen uh, right figures. I will not um, go through them one by one. I just move on to the discussion part. So this is the. Um, Average word length, the clustering results, right. and then uh, the uh, result of STTR clustering results, uh, the MATTR, and also uh, the other ones like the PUS content words, PUS of function words, and the uh, lexical density as well as the activity, right. and then the um, average sentence length, right. a dependency distance, and also a paragraph lens in sentence, paragraph lens in tokens. So this is a paragraph lens in sentence, the clustering result, and then the paragraph lens in token, the result of the clustering, and the um, sentiment analysis, the clustering um, based on the results of the sentiment analysis, and also the uh, text uh, similarity. And based on all the previous uh, features, um, also a multiple feature, a lot of this has been done. Um, here's the result of the um, clustering. Um, and then I, I move to have a very a brief summary and discussion of the- We're just, uh, at, just at time. So if you want to just yeah, wrap up quickly. Yeah, yeah, very quick, yeah. very okay, quick. The result of, yeah, result of, yeah, um, <clears throat> sorry about that. So here, 
is the summary of the previous re uh, mentioned results of it, as we can see. Um, <clears throat> for the um, right for the several features, we can see that the best result, right? Um, uh, right sorry about that. As you can see, the accurate clustering of the lower with uh, the chapter order considered, which I mean, for example, uh, if for um, a, a TSR is clustering to two groups. Um, Group one is com right, comprised the chapters from chapter one to 10, right? And then uh, cluster two comprises chapter 11 to uh, 30 or something. This is what I mean um, uh, with the chapter order considered, right? So with the chapter order considered, as you can see, the best um, um, indicator is the, uh, should be the POS of content words and also uh, the modern features as well, sentiment. Well, the worst one, right, is uh, the, Average word lens, or and also POS of con function words, right? Uh, LD and also activity, as well as paragraph lens in sentence, paragraph lens in token. Well, if we do not consider the order of the chapters, that is to say, for example, cluster one consists of, well, comprised of ten chapters, but the chapters are not in, cons uh, in successive numbers. Maybe chapter one, chapter two, chapter eleven, chapter thirty, or something in 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 one cluster. So if we do not consider the chapter order, uh, we can see that the best um, indicator should be the multiple features. All the five are correctly uh, clustered, right? And then uh, we can see the dependence distance is a very is also a very good indicator. And then is the POS of content words, POS of content words. The worst is also parag uh, paragraph lens, paragraph lens. So uh, to sum up from the analysis, we can see that if we do not uh, consider the chapter order, if we, uh, if we uh, consider the chapter order, that means the chapters in a cluster are successive ones. The, um, the most accurate clustering it should be the POS of content words and then sentiment and then multiple features. Or well, the second most uh, accurate one is SDTR, MATTR, or ASL, and also DD. Well, the worst one is uh, the other ones. Right. If we do not take the um, chapter order into account, we can see that the most effective one, the most accurate one should be the multiple features, and then POS of content words and dependence dif distance. Right. Well, the, the worst one is also uh, POS. Right. So uh, that is to say, multiple feature is the most accurate method of uh, authorship attribution for the five MAFs examined in the in the in prevalence study. Um, so in terms of the individual feature, uh, POS of content words is the best one, or is the most effective um, indicator right, to um, right attribute authorship. And then uh, dependent distance is also a very good feature, right, as well as the content words. Right. Um, as for which chapters are written by another writer, uh, we have confirmed that for two of the labels, the ABH and LSG, we can confirm that chapters 12 to 32 of ABH and chapters uh, 17 to 20 of LSG are ghost written by another writer, right, um, respectively. Well, for the other three, we cannot draw a very uh, safe conclusion as to which chapters are ghost written, but we can confirm that. Um, the uh, several chap the, the, the chapters, the number of chapters, um, right, as mentioned on the online source is, is indeed true, right? Um, so our results show that the five MFs are indeed statistically and linguistically inconsistent, right? but there are also some um limitations of the study because, um, uh, as we um know that the um, it depends on the, the data, depends on the accuracy of the tools, such as the uh, package for uh, POS and also segmentation. So, the package we use for uh, POS is a uh, JBAR package. Um, it's uh, only about 80% of accuracy. So, there may be some errors for, for that. In the future study, maybe we can use more accurate uh, tools and al algorithms with higher accuracy for. For, for the attribution, uh, like the um, uh, word to vector and so on. Um, so this is um, basically my um, talk for the analysis. So thanks, thanks very much for the uh, for your listening and uh, for your attention. Thanks very much. That's what I'm going to say. Great, Tana. Thank you very much for that. Um, looks like a yeah, a quite exhaustive analysis of yeah, an area that it is not one I'm I'm very familiar with, but it certainly looks like a really interesting methodology.
Um, so I know authorship, identifying authorship is is something that a lot of people working across literature in, in different languages and, and periods are quite keen to, to use um, as a tool. Uh, we've, yeah, we're sort of, we're at, I'm conscious we're at time, um, but we are uh, on a break now uh, for an hour. We're coming back at, at 5.30 p.m. my time, so in an hour's time. Um, but yeah, if there's any questions, um, uh, we can probably have a question um, for Hua Tan if, if there is one, and, and otherwise we'll see people back in, in an hour. Uh, an hour is around uh, my bedtime here on yep. the West Coast, but uh, thanks so much for, for organizing this. It's, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, well, thank, thanks for staying up <laughs> and for your great keynote. That was really interesting. Yeah, thank yeah, you so I, much, Gwen. It's really fascinating to, to hear your thoughts and thanks for staying up so late as well. I hope your kids are okay. <laughs> oh yeah i the, the the break came at just the right time to like go tuck them in and uh uh here my my second grader uh explained to me what a conclusion is um in, in case you're curious a conclusion i feel like this is this is the best definition i've ever heard in my life um it's a friendly kind of bossy goodbye <laughs> so there you go. i love it that's perfect we'll think of that at the end of our day <laughs> yes <laughs> so on 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 that note um have have a wonderful rest of the conference and uh um i look forward to catching up on on any any tweeting in the morning great cool. thanks, thanks very much take care yeah um yeah I'm